Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm just letting people in. So it'll just be another minute or so. Um, just to let you know, we are recording this evening. Um, hope that's okay. And we'll get started in just a moment. Everyone is just joining. So I hope everyone is having a wonderful Pride Month so far. Happy Pride. We're so excited at MOFAD to be partnering with Queer Food Foundation um, on this series. This is our second program this month. We have one more next week. So I hope you'll come back for that. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Sari. I am the Public Programs Director at MOFAD. Museum of Food and Drink. If you are joining us for the first time, welcome. We are so happy to have you here. If you've uh, been with us through throughout this past year doing virtual programming, welcome back. We love having you be part of our greater virtual community. Um, we are going to start doing some in-person programs in the fall. So I hope that you are signed up for our newsletter. So you don't wanna miss that, especially if you're in the New York area. Um, but if you're not, we're still going to do virtual programs because we love being able to connect with all of you out there. Um, so without too much further ado, I want to pass, pass the mic over to my friend Gabrielle from Queer Food Foundation. And she's going to tell you a little bit more about the work that she does and introduce our panelists tonight. Um, so just quickly, there's going to be some cocktails, cocktail demos at the beginning. Um, there's some recipes that go along. Some of you might, might have received it already in your email. I'll send it again tomorrow. So not to worry if you're not making them tonight. Um, this is being recorded, like I said, so I'll send out the video so you can watch it anytime. You can make these cocktails anytime. And then later on in the evening, uh, there's going to be some cooking and then there's going to be some amazing uh, storytelling and performance. Um, feel free to chat or comment at any time in the chat function and um, we'll just get to questions as best we can as they come up. So enjoy the show. Happy Pride. Thank you again so much for being with us tonight. Hi everybody. Um, thank you, Sari. We're so excited to collab with the MOFAD. I'm Gabrielle, a co-producer of the Queer Food Foundation. Um, QFF is a collective of queer folks in food who are dedicated to promoting, creating, um, and funding queer food spaces. We also aspire to act as a resource for queer food, work queer food workers um, and those in the beverage world across the nation. Um, just to go off what Sari said, as a reminder, continue to drop your questions or comments below. We're going to be monitoring the chat and we'd love to see the interaction. Um, so without any further ado, it is now my honor to introduce to you our two beverage experts of the night. First up is going to be Andra A.J. Johnson, um, who is currently the bar director of Serenata and Zumu Concept in La Coseca, where she renews her commitment to providing exemplary service and thoughtful cocktails each day. Her forthcoming book, White Plates, Black Faces, continues her work telling the stories of people of color in the restaurant industry. She is also a co-founder of DMV Black Restaurant Week, which I think is going on right now. I could be wrong, but I think it's going on right now. Um, and heads up a cocktail pop-up initiative called Back to Black that strives to raise funds to donate to overlooked and underfunded charities and organizations in the DC area. Thanks, Sandra. Then we will have Tiffany Barrier, who is a bartender, influencer, and educator who has been awarded with some of the beverage industry's highest honors. The Bar Smart graduate is a Tastemaker of the South award winner who spent seven years as the beverage director of One Flew South, the best airport bar in the world. She is known for her creative and innovative cocktail menus for pop-up dinners and bar consultancy clients, hosting mixology classes around the nation and connecting culinary and farm culture with spirits. Tiffany is a member of Tales of the Cocktail Grants Committee, the James Beard Beverage Advisory Board, and is a member of the Atlanta chapter of Les Dames d'Escoffier. She received the Tales of the Cocktail Dom of the Year Award in 2020 and the cover photo of BB Mag for the Top 75 for MBB. And, that, and now I'm gonna pass the mic over to AJ. Thank so we can get started. Much. No worries. I, I thank you so much for that introduction, Gabrielle. Uh, thank you to MoFat. Thank you to Queer Food Foundation. Thank you to The Blend uh, for having me here, inviting me um, in this space. Um, I cannot tell you uh, how excited I am, how humbled I am to be here, um, sitting alongside um, some amazing folks. Um, I love the name of this uh, programming, right? Um, Tales from Our Table. Um, and it's so great to see some amazing 
uh, artists doing what they do best uh, in this industry and having a, a light sort of shown on sort of what it is that we do. Uh, so I currently, as Gabrielle had said, I am uh, the beverage director and managing partner of a Serenata in Zumo, a d and Black Restaurant Week we actually do in November, uh, but we do have a Virginia uh, set that we are doing uh, next week, actually, uh, for from the 19th to the 26th. Uh, that is our first foray into Virginia. So we are really sort of um, spreading our wings a little bit with that programming. Um, and for those of you that haven't uh, heard of Back to Black, uh, we do do um, a lot of charity events. Uh, we've given over $36,000 in just about a year. Um, and so I'm super, super proud of that programming and that initiative. Um, and you can check out all of our stuff on Instagram. Um, I'll put all that stuff in the chat later, okay? Uh, so my cocktail that I'm gonna start with is, I believe, um, and I think a lot of other people would agree with me, uh, the, the mother of the pride event, right? Uh, we, we all know pride started as a right. Um, and so I, I want to celebrate Marsha P. Johnson in the way that she should have always been celebrated. Um, the one thing with pride um, I, I find trouble with sort of getting into all the time um, is the fact that I do think there are a lot of forgotten letters uh, that are happening here. And Marsha, along with Sylvia Rivera, uh, really were sort of that, they, they broke the mold, uh, so to speak, right? Uh, by throwing those bricks and really standing up uh, to, to the police in that raid that evening, um, which sparked um, what we do now, which is um, celebrate who we are. Um, they really did pave the way. Um, and in my cocktailing over the years, the way that I know best to really pay homage to someone is doing it in a cocktail form. All right, so that is exactly what we're, do we're gonna do. Now, Marsha P. Johnson uh, was a part of a uh, drag theater troupe uh, called Hot Peaches. So our cocktail this evening is going to be called Hot Peaches, all right? I tried to bring in a lot of different pieces, right? To really sort of tell her story, to, uh, who she was as Malcolm maybe, right? And who she was as Marsha. Um, to really sort of bring together something really cohesive from a flavor standpoint that's not only delicious, but really sort of super fun and easy to make. Now, in terms of what we need to kind of start, I asked for everyone if you could have made a, it's a peach and Jersey Mac apple simple syrup, right? Um, added with your jalapenos. If you were able to sort of put that together, that's fantastic. If you weren't, we can still sort of do a, a semi-maceration of those as well, but I'll be able to go through the cocktail um, as I've done it and be able to put the list and the ingredients and things like that in the chat afterwards, okay? So first what I'm gonna do, if you haven't put your simple syrup together, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna cut up that hot part of what we're doing is our jalapeno. Okay, so I've got my cutting board here. I'm gonna hope that my cat doesn't hop on my board. Um, but we're gonna go ahead, take our one jalapeno. We're gonna slice off the top and just cut it lengthwise. I've got a pretty big one here, so I'm gonna cut it twice. So we should have two lengths of the jalapeno there. Now, the way to mitigate your spice is by taking out the seeds, okay? So I want a little bit of spice with what I'm doing. So all I'm gonna do is take one half of my lengthwise cut jalapeno, take a small spoon so that my fingers don't get super spicy, right? And just push out those seeds and just discard them. So I've got one half with seeds and another half without, all right? We're gonna set that aside and we're gonna start building our cocktail. So we do need a shaker tin for this. If you have a jigger, a jigger is very, very important to what we do in order to keep things consistent, all right? You're definitely gonna need ice. Really can't have a cocktail without ice, right? It's the dark horse ingredient. We need our rum. So I'm using a, an Afro-Caribbean rum that's actually done with um, Caribbean uh, barrel-aged rum and then African sugarcane juice. We have our coconut and peaches and Jersey Mac apples because Marsha was from New Jersey, boom, into my syrup and club soda, okay? We definitely wanna put these into a highball cocktail because this is a version of a highball, right? There's nothing like having some bubbles in the summertime, more like a spritzy kind of situation, all right? And let's get started. 
So let's go ahead and throw our jalapenos just right, boom, into our tin. Just throw them in there, okay? No ice, no nothing, okay? Let's grab our jigger. We're gonna use two ounces of our rum and pop that in. I'm gonna actually make two portions because uh, my partner is home as well. So she'd like to try this with me, okay? So two ounces of our rum. We need two ounces of our peach and Jersey Mac apple, simple, okay? And now for the base of that, I like to use coconut water on my, uh, on my cocktail simples instead of just regular water. I feel like it gives it a little bit more texture. You get a little bit more um, of a, a wheat um, and bready texture within your cocktails. And I just, I love it. It's just an added little touch, all right? And that's all we need, right? We've got our syrup, we've got our rum, uh, we've got our jalapenos right on in. So now we're gonna add ice to our tin. Okay, don't be afraid of using that ice, all right? Let's go ahead and lock in. Now when we're shaking, we're not gonna shake down here. We're not gonna shake up here. We're gonna take our non-dominant hand, put that on the bottom, our dominant hand and put it on top and just push out our tin so it's parallel with the ground. And we're gonna push out and whip it. Instead yeah. of just it the floor, we're gonna whip it. That's cool, man, Jay. Yeah, like, 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 like. yeah. <laughs> All right. And so we're gonna whip that cocktail vigorously, right? 20 to 30 seconds, really nice and hot. Come through, boo. come through. I don't know it. Yes. Now a good way to practice your shaking is if you have uncooked rice, put that in your shaker tin and just practice the motion until you build up your speed, okay? So let's go ahead. We're gonna unlock our tins. If you have a two piece like I do, there should be a mark where, you're the, um, where it freezes up and then it should be blank there, right? That is the line in which your tins are locked. And that's the point of the most resistant, of the least resistance. So you're gonna take the heel of your palm and just knock. There you go. You should have a really nice frothiness on the top of your cocktail, okay? Then all you're gonna do here, you can strain it straight out. You can with this cocktail because I love the syrup on this. You're more than welcome to dirty dump if you'd like. That sounds. Boom. And I'm gonna pull out my jalapenos, Abby, but. I wanna get this cocktail done for you all. Now don't add more ice to this, right? Don't add more ice, not yet. We wanna add our soda water right on top because we want everything to really nice blend in. Right, you don't wanna to have to stir and then you have all your mixture, your really nice, beautiful flavors on the bottom and then separated by ice and then soda water, right? You want everything together. So once you've got that done, now you can add ice to your cocktail. You can garnish it if you like with your jalapeno, but I say always go sweet peach all day long, get that really nice hit of natural fruit on the end of that to really sort of cut and mitigate your spice. It actually goes extremely well uh, with soda water as well. Um, you do just get this really nice full flavor situation with your cocktail. And that, my friends, is hot peaches mm. all day long. Thank you so Yay. much. Um, again, and of course, it's like sitting right behind me, I believe, on my bar. But you're more than welcome to strain out, right? If you've already made your simple syrup with your spice in there, you're pretty much OK. You don't have to worry about pulling out your jalapenos or anything like that. Um, but if you haven't, then yes, I do say strain your cocktails out, then add your soda water, but always add your ice last because ice will start to water down your drink as it goes on um, faster and faster. So you do not want that, okay? And that is hot peaches. <laughs> Love you, Marsha. Thank you, Marsha. And thank you to MoFad and Queer Foundation um, and The Blend for having me on. Um, I am actually gonna pass this on over to Tiffany. Um, I've been watching her for forever. Um, <laughs> and I just am so enamored with everything that she has done. Um, I was gifted uh, the book Jubilee and I kept, I obviously, because I'm a cocktail and I scroll through to the cocktail part or whatever. And I see this woman's name and I'm like, who is this lady? 
Um, and she happens to be like literally one of the most amazing people that I've never met. Um, and so if it wasn't for this uh, event, you know, like we wouldn't have even had any real, you know, contact in that way, um, possibly without like Instagram. Uh, so I'm forever grateful, uh, just even for the introduction. Um, and hopefully it brings something fruitful. So let's see what she's got. I know that she's got a really, really fun cocktail with a really, really fun place. So Tiffany, take it. Take it. Oh, <laughs> my heart is fluttering. Oh my gosh. Uh, everything AJ just said uh, is such a feeling. And if you're not salivating right now or your heart's beating really fast or your cheeks are hurting from smiling, then I don't know how you missed the energy that this woman just shared with us. The history, the style, the technique, that is the joy of what we love to do as a Black, as queer, as hospitalians, um, as bartenders, we absolutely love to give us. Um, if we can transform us into a glass, that's what we do. And that's what my best friend that I never met, but we're connected, just did. It's just, it's epic. It's epic. I see that I'm on a speaker screen and I'm going to take me off the speaker screen because I want to see other people. I am not going to force you to come off camera. Nevertheless, this is a pride situation. I know we're zoomed out. I don't care if you're drinking water, Coke, Sprite, tea, wine, tequila shots. We want to see your face. And if you don't want to show your face, show me your glass. Show us something. We just want to feel the energy. We're in a space we're in a good space. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are in a transition. There's progression going it step by step from every block to every city to every country. We are seeing freedom and pride come in multiple ways. As of yesterday, we see Juneteenth as an actual holiday. The it's it's, it's these baby steps that we have been fighting for for years in multiple generations, but this is our time now. This is like ours. And so while we're fighting, I feel that we need to be celebrating as well. So I'm just really happy once again to be with the Most Bad family and meet new family and connect with others in just a, a whole. Um, I am Tiffany Barrier here in Atlanta, Georgia, Southern Belle always. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just love cocktails. I always have, but as a woman, I love uh, attention to detail. I love a theme. And nothing says the theme like pride colors to me. When we were kids, it was like Roy G. Biff. And I was like, no, it's something <laughs> else. Like it's something else. It just always gave me a feeling since I was a kid. Um, rainbow bright, butterflies, ladybugs. That feeling just helped me to encompass who I was as the queer woman that I am today. The cocktail that I'm gonna create is all of those feelings. I call it a midday ballroom because ballroom is something that I have the pleasure of sneaking into here and there, but it was at night. So if there could be a ballroom in the middle of the day, this is the cocktail I wanna be drinking. I, I don't wanna do sneak to the ballroom at night. I wanna be like, it's 12.30 after lunch, let's go to the ballroom. And I wanna see us express ourselves. So this cocktail gives me that. Um, every ingredient stands for each acronym in our family, LGBTQIA, and I will build it that way. So the L will be some lemon. I told you I love a theme. I love anything that I can play with. So the L will be a lemon. Um, I've already sliced it up so I can, not take too much time, but I just sliced half a lemon, juice it right in there. Um, I love a tool in the house. So kitchen tools are super fun. Hand juicers, um, anything like that's fun. But if you don't have that, you have two hands that do just well. I'm getting everything from that lemon. And then I've got a quarter of a grapefruit, ruby red, whatever you like, pink grapefruit, a quarter of that. They're so big. So cut that in half, cut that half in half. We love some good citrus. Like there's nothing like a good balance in a cocktail. We love sweet, we love sour. You put those two together with a little bit of alcohol, you have a little bit of party. So I'm juicing that grapefruit right inside. The G is for grapefruit. Don't worry about the seeds, you'll be fine. Then I've got some bitters. Those that are wondering what bitters is, 
yes, it is a spice agent. You hear us call it everything from the salt and pepper to a cocktail to some seasoning. My best friend calls it the hot sauce of a cocktail because you just need a couple of drops inside of it. Bitters is embodied with a lot of flavors, originally coming from um, West Indies, from a man named Raman Quasi, a Black gentleman who was a slave who was free to help work on his botany and share his healing technique in Europe. The original bitters has a crescent on it because it was given to the queen every year. Um, it's kind of a homage to have this healing mechanism. And when we drank back in the 1300s, 1400s, or even before that, drinking was for healing. Note that, drinking's for healing, all right? So I'm dropping some bitters in, uh, female on brand bitter lab. My bitters I'm using today is a fig and walnut, because why not? So the P is for bitters. Just doing a couple of dashes in there. When you play with bitters, open it up, of course, smell it, taste it. Curiosity never killed anybody. So just give it a taste. Some bitters has alcohol, some bitters doesn't, but bitters is a seasoning agent. We write recipes as bartenders for you, but sometimes you don't have to follow them precisely. They may say two or three dashes, but if you're into that flavor, dash on, do your thing. Chef always says a pinch of salt, you never listen. You do what you gotta do. But I'm building this cocktail so the base, I can at least taste and work with it and build up on it. Now that I have my bitters inside, I'm gonna skip tea right now. Don't worry, I'll be back to her. Um, but I'm gonna put a little bit of ice inside because I, ice. It's not many fun ingredients to start with I that I could play with. Ice cream wouldn't have been cute tonight. So I'm just putting some ice inside. <laughs> Back to my tea, tequila. Tequila rhymes with Tiffany. Come on, it had to do it. It's a fun spirit, but tequila does have that beautiful uh, flavor agent to it. Um, it is quite indigenous to Mexico. It comes in a few different flavors, but it is the good fat, which I like to say, as they say, avocado is the good fat. This is the good sugar right here. It's the good stuff. And one of the few ingredients, uh, I'm sorry, spirits next to rum, which AJ used that talks about grass to glass. We talk about bourbon, but we all talk about corn. We talk about vodka, but we're not like, hey, what kind of wheat was that? We don't get nerdy on that. But when we talk about rum, we speak on the sugar cane itself. Unfortunately, it has a quite dark history with slavery. Nevertheless, we're bringing it forth by using it in a lot more uh, cocktails and also sharing the other narrative. The same with tequila. It gets a really odd condensation. However, it's always drank at celebration time, which is every day. <laughs> Two ounces of tequila going right inside. That's my tea. Uh, see how I did that? The tea. I could play with that for a minute. And then I'm going to put the agave for A, sweetener. When we are using tequila, we want to use its best friend, what it comes from, which is the agave. The pita that is grown underneath the ground in Mexico is the good sweet sticky stuff. If you wanna use your favorite sweetener, that's fine. But the agave has this lovely butteriness that really brings that tequila into the place it needs to be. And a little bit of Aperol. We see this girl everywhere. Um, she's the spritz, she makes everything happy. But joy happens in the eye as well. When we see a cocktail and has color, we're instantly like, yes, please, I'll have that. You're not even thinking about what's inside of it, but your eyes are like, Yes, please, I'll have that. So I'm gonna add the Aperol in for a little bit of color, also representing the A. Matching all outfits, no matter where you go. Ice is inside, every ingredient, every letter is inside except my tonic. I don't wanna shake my tonic because I want to drink the cocktail, not wear the cocktail. I put this, if I put this tonic inside, I don't think you wanna see that and I don't wanna see that on you. So when you make this cocktail, please remember to build all of the ingredients except for the effervescence of the tonic. I'm gonna to go ahead and cap that. I'm using a nice big glass because why not? Um, I, we, I need some space. I need something that has some volume because I will be adding effervescence bubbles inside. Again, I said this was the midday ball. I want something that I can hold with a long stem so my hot hand doesn't hold it. So something with a long stem there so I can, you know, praise and share yeah. what I need to share. While I have that glass out, I'm going to go ahead and put ice in it. Like AJ was telling you all, ice is just super important to us. The way a chef needs fire, we need ice. Um, AJ put ice in last with a very, very amazing fact. 
You don't want, you want that ice in last so it doesn't over dilute what you have going on. But I have dense ice, big ice cubes. So they're gonna hold on to this cocktail a little bit more. Again, I'm visualizing, I'm at the club in the daytime. I need it as cold as possible, okay? I got my big ice cubes inside. I'm going to place my tonic water on the bottom just because there's enough effervescence inside of this and those bubbles are active. That way when I pour my shaking content, those bubbles are like, come to me, come to me. And they're gonna just hold on to it instantly. I'm gonna give this thing a shake. I'm not gonna look as good as AJ did, but remember what she said, okay? There you go, just whip it. I love that. That's a good shake, I'm telling you. As long as it, you whip it back to you, everything comes together. And I love that. And again, the ice that Tiffany's using is super dope. Um, essentially all of the oxygen is taken out of it. So it doesn't melt at the same consistency and the same speed that some of the smaller ice cubes do like your one by ones and things like that. Yeah. Um, that's a great tip. If you can get nice climb of ice at home, power to you. Yes, you can get it, get it. But if you can use whatever ice you have, whatever you want. I'm ready to garnish it, but I'm gonna garnish it from within. I wrote in the recipe, garnish with whatever you want, because I mean, come on, uh, freedom is here. <laughs> Liberation is here. I'm not gonna tell you lemon, lime, orange, grapefruit, whatever you want. So I'm gonna put everything. I'm gonna throw a couple of limes inside, a slice of orange. I got some blackberries, some raspberries, just so I can have a photogenic cocktail. Then I'm gonna pour my shaken content right inside. Mm -hmm. I love how that's rising up like that. It's yes. like the bubbles just sort of take it with it. That's gorgeous. It grabs a hold of it instantly. I don't need a spoon because everything just met each other and they're ready for the party. I'm going to garnish a little more because I love fruit, but I love fruit even more when it's soaked in alcohol. So there we have it. And this is what I call the midday bar. Love it. Gorgeous. Cheers, Alan. Mm. Because I did not make it, I'm doing it for you. I'm drinking it for you. Thank you. But I hope you all make that and enjoy it just like I am. Nah, that's super. That's so dope. I love the way you did that. Because literally when you said like, oh, it's going to be every single letter. I was like, wow, it's going to be so much alcohol. Um, I just, I love how like you, you used, you know, ingredients that we would generally use. So it stays, you know, the proper amount of boozy. It stays the right amount of balance. Um, I love a cocktail with good acid in it. So shit, I should have made that. I, <laughs> I want to hand this over to you. Like, can you just all right, through the swap real quick? All right, all right. <laughs> so yeah, so I'm, I was just going through the chat. I mean, everybody loves the drinks and everybody loves you. There's a lot of we love you, Tiffany, in this chat. Oh, Poos, I love y'all too. Indeed. Hey, I want to see some glasses. Just put your glass in the in your in your frame. I just want to see it. Just yeah. <laughs> you can hide behind the glass if you'd like. I do it all the time. <laughs> Perfect. Cheers to you all. We deserve it. Um, and if you're not drinking tonight, you can still make this a great mocktail using every ingredient I said, just taking out the tequila, you still get that great flavor. Like that. Dan, I guess that's the same here. You don't need the rum on this one either. You can Here's make a rum delicious. Yeah. And those, I mean, those serve, they last like three, four weeks, right? Like you've got a, you've got a good amount of time on those. So yeah, thank you. See, Tiffany always, she always has all of the notes. She connects all the dots. I love it. <laughs> Connecting them just as much. You, I'm not. You put the drinking coach down for a minute. You had all the facts. I couldn't even it was like what AJ said. What AJ said. Fair enough. Oh, I, knew, I knew my cat was gonna make an appearance here. Um, he loves. Oh. The he he just loves the cutting board, um, which is great. <laughs> uh, oh, there's jalapeno on it, so we'll figure it out. We'll see how he feels later. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Tiffany, and thank you so much, AJ. Don't those drinks look good? Because I know what I'm doing this weekend. I'm not currently drinking, but I'm definitely making both of those cocktails this weekend. Um, big shout out to Marsha P. Johnson and Sil Sylvia Rivera for leading the, the riot. Um, and now we're going to move on to the storytelling part of the evening. So I'm going to introduce you to 
um, two dykes and a knife first, um, followed by the fabulous junior men. So two dykes and a knife was uh, conceived in 2017 by Lovey and Pratika. Uh, their shared their shared theory is that. The dining table is a plentiful site and platform for copious intersections, be it your race, class, politics, religious beliefs, or orientation. Food is a necessary nourishment that unintentionally unites people. So they're going to, going to be at first, and then we'll have Junior Min. Junior Min is a drag artist and preacher based in Brooklyn. She is out to show how minty the world can be with a little kindness, empathy, and a strong Black trans queer perspective. Yes, I'm, edu I'm educating and entertaining with the same motivational speaking, burlesque, drag, visual art, and stand-up flavors you love, but with an empowering and intersectional twist. No matter what happens, when you see Junior Mint, you'll leave feeling motivated and embraced. She also has a new palette out. I'm going to do a little <laughs> plug little promo for her. She has a new palette out called Minty, and it is fabulous. You have to get it. So without any um, interruptions, I'm now going to pass it over to Two Dykes and a Knife. <laughs> y'all. Hey, what's up y'all? Thanks for having us. MoFag, what's up? Um, so this is our first time doing anything on camera together. We're typically, and live. And live. So we're typically like in our own space, reimagining things, playing around with spices and ingredients, sort of the way that we do in our art studios. Um, we're two interdisciplinary artists who um, dare not take the credit away from chefs who have been doing this for years and for decades and who have totally committed their lives to uh, reimagining food and reimagining ingredients and doing all the, the, the ethnography and cultural research that's necessary. Um, we're visual artists who just happen to really, really love food and the history of food and the way food connects and unites people globally. Um, I love uh, kind of tracing spices and ingredients and figuring out how trade was before, you know, uh, colonization, post-colonization. Um, I'm an African-American woman from Houston, Texas, uh, Texas, Juneteenth. Uh, we're celebrating Juneteenth today also. So, you know, we're here with, yeah. with that pride. Um, and, and my partner here. Um, I'm from India, so mm -hmm. our flavors come together like really well and it's really interesting and we two dykes and a knife kind of started out with just us talking a lot about food when we were eating together so um, the conversations we were having around our cultures and around like she said trade and um, how spices got around to different places was just kind of fascinating and um, we thought this would be really great for people of uh, disparate communities to share these kinds of conversations with um, in such a divided uh, country. Um, so um, we sort of borrow, and as we've been listening to Tiffany and AJ, we've sort of borrowed some ingredients as you guys have been playing around and as you have been making your cocktails and we realize that there's so many uh, ingredients that we just happen to all think up commonly that we sort of, um, so I've sort of taken a few, first of all, the drink we made uh, has a peach, um, a peach simple syrup that's made from coconut water, brown sugar, and sliced peaches, reduced it down, strained it, mixed it with some whiskey, added a little bit of agave, some lime juice, and so now we're feeling nice. Yeah. Feeling, feeling quite buzz. Love the um, coconut water tip, AJ. That's like, I'm going to carry yeah, that. Yeah, we're going to carry that forever. Thank awesome. you very much. The um, coconut is good. And today we're making like some fried chicken. So we're both vegetarian. Yeah. And part of what we love to do is kind of, you know, re reintroduce people to the fact that, um, first of all, African American people, Black folks, were mostly vegetarian. Um, meat was introduced to our diets on weekends, special holidays, um, but we mostly lived off the land: collard greens, sweet potatoes, mushrooms, berries. We 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 utilized ingredients when they were at their the height of their season um, and at the height of their um, um, nutritional utility. Um, and so today we're making some fried chicken with these beautiful oyster mushrooms. These beautiful oyster mushrooms. This is our chicken, right? Yeah. And so I also grew up vegetarian, just uh, culturally as a, a Hindu person. Uh, most 
I would say a lot of people in India are vegetarian. Um, so uh, in America, what's seen as such a like trendy fad and like and like newfound lifestyle of being vegan or vegetarian. Um, I was kind of like, well, this has been around for a while and, and um, we like to, eaten. this is the way I've always eaten. And so I like where we both come together on that too. Um, it's important to not think of vegetarian food as, as rabbit food. And, and it's important to, um, for us too, to be able to push what vegetarian means and, and not vegan. Cause we, we love our, we love uh, our butter, <laughs> our cheese and our eggs. Yeah. So, so. That, that we're not, we're not missing that. Um, the first thing we're going to do with okay. these, let me back up a little bit. Okay. Again, I told you we're new to this. Um, I typically get my oyster mushrooms for about $5 a pound at Asian markets or international markets. Yeah. Um, if you try to go to any other conventional market, they're going to be about 30 bucks a pound. Correct. Okay. So Hit up your Korean grocery stores or your... Uh, well, we have a lot of Korean markets here. Yeah, in this is a very diverse community, um, so we have tons of international markets. Um, but H Mart is national, I think. I think it yeah, is. Yeah, they have it in Chicago. And if you can't find them at your conventional grocery store, you can order oyster mushrooms on online. All right. Cool. I'm going to pass these over to Prithika. She's going to um, pour. I don't buy buttermilk when I bake or when I cook. I make my buttermilk from just milk. A little bit of lemon juice or vinegar, and then I add this uh, Louisiana hot sauce to this to this milk. And so this is going to be our, our hot sauce buttermilk, and that's what, what we're going to. What do you think of sea Yeah, I got it somewhere here. Oh, sorry. Just measured it out, y'all. Look at that hot sauce going in the buttermilk. Stir it up a little bit, and then I'm just going to pour it over the mushrooms while we prepare the other stuff. These will just be like soaking in this buttermilk mixture. Hot oh, sauce, yes. Yes, Louisiana hot sauce, there's nothing like it. Let those just sit there, marinate, they're gonna soak up. What, what's gonna happen is the vinegar and the hot sauce is gonna penetrate the mushrooms, penetrate, and also sort of give them a little, a little chicken, more like a gristly texture um and kind of give you know give you a different flavor to these mushrooms all right and then right here what i have is a dry dredge my dry dredge has a cup of flour a quarter cup of corn meal a quarter teaspoon of corn starch mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mix it all together. we're gonna mix it all up mm -hmm. our oil is uh getting pretty hot in front of us i turned it down okay I hope it's not like me. It's like a full-on heat wave down here too, y'all. It's 106 degrees today. All right, I got that nice and mixed up. I'm gonna go in with a teaspoon of salt, Himalayan sea salt. Hey! <laughs> so first black, black pepper. Uh, all the way. Got a teaspoon of smoked paprika. Teaspoon of onion powder. Y'all know fried chicken. <laughs> yeah. You know the ingredients. What's next? <laughs> teaspoon of onion powder. I have a question though. A question. Like, come on. How do you test how it, like your oil is hot? Because like my wife, she like does like, the popcorn kernel thing. I I use I, I bake a lot, so I just have this convenient little thing. Right now, I like to get it at about 300. My new stove has is about 100 degrees over, so we turned it down. So the bubbles can start to come down a little bit and we'll get an even fry on the oyster once it's once there's no heat radiating into the pan. Love it. All right. So what, kind of oil are, what kind of oil are y'all using? Oh yeah. So I fried with half canola oil, half avocado oil. Because yeah. it can take the heat. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we just started using avocado oil more yeah. in, in the kitchen and it's 
it's really nice. It's really clean and light. It doesn't feel um, as heavy. I'm going to chew you a little bit because we're in kind of a Caribbean mood. Uh, yeah. Caribbean is where our cultures sort of unite. It's an intersection. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm going to add a little bit of cumin. And I'm going to cheat a little bit with Jamaican curry powder. Woo. Just on the fly, right? That's a good cheat code. We do a lot of like pinch here, pinch there. So all right. we're going to mix this all <laughs> up. You know, you want to get that nice pink color, right? We're looking for that almost light terracotta. And you want to mix it real good because you don't want any patches of like paprika or garlic or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And that was all purpose flour, if, right. I, didn't, if yeah. I didn't say. Nice. All right. So these are like my favorite pieces because they remind me. So I'm seven years vegetarian. And um, sometimes you just want a good, you know, a good, a good chicken. So we got a nice coating on here, nice, good, hot, saucy buttermilk. You want to try and get it in all the crevices. And then I'm going to go straight to the flour. I'm going to keep a dry hand, wet hand. Come on, fried chicken. <laughs> Love you, Sam. The uh, <laughs> cook in her family growing up. So I love this recipe because she really like emulates her father in the kitchen. And it's a beautiful, uh, it's a beautiful thing to see. Dry hand to get it all coated on, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. And before I put this entire thigh <laughs> <laughs> or this mushroom flour into the pan. We're going to start off with a small one just to kind of test my heat. I think I'm right. still at about 350, which means this is going to fry it pretty fast. But the thing about that is it's not chicken. So it doesn't have that muscle fiber to break through. So it's going to fry pretty fast and that's okay. You end up with a fresh mushroom and a nice little crusty buttermilk crust going on. So we're going to go in, fingers crossed. It's y'all. So let me tell y'all. <laughs> The sun is out. It's like bright. It's 100 degrees and it just started raining. Right. So I was like, like, oh, my hearing. <laughs> it's just warm outside. That's cool. There we go. You want those Ooh. bubbles? Yes. As we're trying anything, that ASMR, lady. ASMR. As we're trying anything, you want to drop it away from you. Y'all hear that? Ooh. I'm like sniffing my screen and be like, what does it smell like over there? <laughs> I hear it. it over the ASMR of the crying. Hold on, one second. Hold on. Alright. Okay. Alright. So here, there's that color, right? Already. You want to wait for 15 minutes? We're all right done. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand this process over to Pritika. And I'm going to work on this really quick jerk sauce. I love making jerk sauce and trash because you get all that fresh thyme, garlic, ginger, scotch bonnet, lime juice. If you guys have a recipe, it's there. If you don't, we'll send it again. Um, but I'm going to pass this on over to her. Yes. I'm going to go wet here and drop it in and hang over here, all right? Okay. Okay. Pass me that way. Yeah, I need some more. I have it. You have it? All right. Uh-huh. Put a bit of mold on just for finishing. While it's still hot. Okay, now we can hear you, Tim. Do you want to Yeah. Tiffany, did you have a question? No, I was just really excited to hear the fryer. <laughs> and I was trying to imagine what it smells like. Yeah. I'm just hungry. That's all. I'm just hungry. <laughs> all right, all right. That's it. <laughs> also, some more Caribbean flavors. We got a little bit of food in the water, right? So I'm going to go in with my liquid and do this. Uh, Vitamix, 
I got a quarter cup of sesame oil mixed with just a little bit of avocado oil just to take away from that super duper sesame flavor. We're gonna go in our oil mix. Soy sauce. I'm gonna have a little more soy sauce. Okay, all right. Oh, no. This is a mixture of uh, molasses and agave. Excuse me, agave. And that sticky sweet molasses. And I love molasses. You gotta have the molasses. So we make our own brown sugar too. I don't buy brown sugar anymore. Yes. I just take raw sugar and add molasses. I had no I idea it was that easy. I don't think a lot of people know that, Chef. I don't think a lot of people know that brown right. sugar is brown because of molasses. And they had to it. do that during the Sugar Act uh, to make money because people were fighting so much for sugar during slavery. Yeah, for sure. I got about a stone size ginger. One scotch bonnet, because we like brown over here. Like, I can't say too much. Here. <laughs> but uh, one scotch bonnet, guys. Half a line. I love that trick with the uh, with the tongs. Oh yeah. I know what I know. It's like a mini version of everything and then like a regular version. Yeah. We got uh, three cloves of garlic, diced. I diced everything so the blender won't have such a hard time getting it smooth. About five stalks of green onions chopped up. Yeah. And I'm gonna go this much time because it's not jerk without time, right? Mm -hmm. Time and time. We're gonna get as much of this off, leaving the the more stalky woodsy ones off. I know there's a trick to this. So yeah, my dad was cooking my house. Like I didn't have a super gendered home. Um, I thought everybody's dad cooked, but my dad was like a barbecue pro. He loved Texas, Louisiana barbecue, um, tamales. Uh, he would always make tamales. We call them hot tamales in Texas. Um, what am I missing from this jerk sauce? I think I'm missing allspice. So allspice right. is like a pimento berry powder. When it's ground up, it sort of has notes of um, nutmeg, cinnamon, things like that. But it can be overpowering, right? So I'm just going to go like about an eighth of a teaspoon. Also known as a pinch. Fresh nutmeg only. Okay? <laughs> Fresh nutmeg. All these are aphrodisiacs. Cinnamon, nutmeg. Ginger, Perfect. Scott wanted, <laughs> and then what I did, AJ, you be proud of me. I uh, I blister some peaches. Hey, hot peaches, baby. So <laughs> we're gonna go in just another type of sugar, right? So we have molasses, we have agave, and then we're gonna add another profile of sugar. So we're trying to build up, that, yeah, uh, heat. this heat. I'm gonna Mark. put like four slices in there, right? Beautiful. And we're ready to go. This is going to be loud. But I'll be right back. See how I feel doing this. Yeah, almost done with the mic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank 
Y'all are so oh, cute. Like, what hand is that hand? I can never. I'm like, what? No, I went, what? <laughs> nah, this is great though. Like, I've been vegetarian for like seven months, so I am learning all the things right now. So this is this is awesome. No good. I'm gonna watch this. Go in for taste, right? Because now this is the part where we add what we need to cook this in. Hey. <laughs> 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 That pieces, I think the pieces got a whole different dimension. What can I say? Ooh, my, like I love the time. Just automatically you're overwhelmed with that like lovely time. And I'm gonna do it one more time. Yeah. Ooh, that's so good. Wow. We try to stock our pantry with um, like we go to the bulk section a lot, right? Instead of getting like big amounts of spices, uh, we find it more economically friendly and also like kind of more adventurous to just go to the bulk section and then just you can just get like a tablespoon at a time of like different spices that you've like never gotten or used. COVID really kind of put a damper on that bulk section for a minute, but down here in Texas where it's like wild, wild country, I think they're better. <laughs> Careful out there, y'all. So we typically have this with like a, a braised in coconut fat or coconut milk, bok choy or snow pea green leaves, collards are an easy way to go. Um, kale even. Kale even. And so we just take, you know, you, you buy a can of coconut milk um, and you don't shake it. You just open the top of it. Pop it open, scoop out that cream fat that's settled on top, and you fry with that. That's basically like vegetarian lard, right? Mm. And so we braise it with a little bit of garlic, a little salt and pepper is all you need. We didn't make those today, but I did want to <laughs> talk about it because this chicken's about to go on a plate all by itself with a little bit of jerk sauce, all right? All by itself. I'm going to move this guy over. Okay. Ta-da! Yeah. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I know, I know. I'm too excited. Hot hands. That's because we're artists, though. These hands have filled nothing. <laughs> so typically with, um, oh yeah, love having sprouts in the kitchen at all times. Just to add a little bit of green, a little bit of pea protein, depending on what kind of sprouts you have. Yeah, uh, snow pea green leaves are a great way to get protein if you're vegetarian and you just, you know, collards give you a lot of vitamins, yeah. vitamin K, yeah. vitamin D. Uh, but as far as getting protein, we use a lot of sprouts. These little babies right here are uh, alfalfa sprouts. Um, so any way we can get extra protein that's plant-based, we go for it. But I'm telling you, this is not, not lacking anything that you miss from having fried chicken. Okay? That's right. Yeah, this is my favorite. I can't get enough of this stuff. It's spicy, though. There's just some, uh, some fried chicken with jerk sauce. Like I said, you can have it with some peas and rice. Um, a cool thing we've Should been we doing do lately, we do yeah, we're going to do that. A thing we've been doing lately is we've been making, uh, you know, like rice and peas with coconut water and coconut milk, and you cook it down just like you would uh, rice and water. Um, so we've been doing kidney peas with quinoa instead of rice. Yeah. And somebody was like, I hate quinoa. That's like, I that's do. like vegan food. That's like rabbit it food. It tastes so like healthy in a bad way, like to me. I always like put a ton of butter in it. But now she can't get enough. She's like, that's but the great. coconut makes yeah. it like clump together yeah. in a real nice, like fatty yeah. kind of way that's so satisfying and so much more. Um, I want y'all to hear this delicious. crunch. Okay. In my mouth, right? We got a little, no. okay. got a little crunch there. Go ahead. Right, I'm going to go in. in. Go in. I'm going to go in. Oh. So you, you got to show you got, me. Yeah, here. Do we need to get close. Hold on. 
it's just a lot juicy because it's soaked up all the hot sauce. See that coming out? Yeah, yeah. Come on. Yeah. What you got? Ah, yeah. I'm gonna dip it in here. Hey, some more, baby. Who's gonna help us eat all this? Mm. Okay, this is not fair. Okay. So, if you are if, 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 if you're thinking about vegetarianism, again, my goal as a as an ex carnivore <laughs> is to explore textures, right, and try to get those same textures. And that sort of that that mind memory, that memory memory of all these experiences, and so mm -hmm. I've been like freezing tofu and like watching it expand and turning more into like a chicken flavor, a uh, chicken texture. Um, this by far is my favorite alternative chicken, even more than like fake processed chicken. We're not a big fan of, of like, like the artificial meat meats because you can get it because yeah. I don't. I grew up vegetarian. I'm not trying to get beef. <laughs> I don't like that flavor. So it's like, okay, how do we use vegetable, like other things, yeah, yeah, to to give us that kind of satisfaction. And this is our favorite chicken. Sometimes we make a, a mm. pan of cornbread, sweet cornbread, with some jalapenos in it. Again, I say we're from Texas. Chopped up jalapenos, maybe some corn kernels. Uh, we'll like make some beans and rice. Um, hmm. So I'll, I do want to say a little bit about two eggs and knife, like the way that we share our creations and um, like the, the the visual artist part comes in in a, in a social practice kind of way. So we we typically host these dinners where pre COVID it was in art spaces um, with like 10 to 15 people a multi-course vegetarian meal and then we would um, introduce each course with a, a prompt or question and get people talking about food memory, um, spice memory, spices, they, you know, who cooked in their home, yeah, where they do their grocery shopping, how far do you have to drive, mm -hmm. um, what's talking food? about food equity and, and cultural uh, like roots yeah and um, yeah it's been it's been beautiful. Lately, we had an event. Um, we recently got a house down here, and uh, it's like our. It was like our fortress during COVID and after COVID too, because it's like, well, here we go. Um, yeah, and uh, and we had a beautiful dinner in the backyard where people were able to be six feet apart, and and some some beautiful conversations were made. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to kind of like talk about how we uh we're, like where where we cook and who our audience is basically yeah. um but it seems like we need a we've been planning an east coast trip so i kind of want to i've never been to atlanta um so yeah. tiffany's in atlanta and we need to make ourselves yeah. get over there hop in the car yeah. Yeah. aj um, where are you at again i'm in dc oh yeah oh sure. my brother's in baltimore so this is great this is a well, great thing Yes. Right. <laughs> so, um, please yeah, come question. to Atlanta. Yes, please come to Atlanta. I've got a, a community garden here on a quarter acre of land, uh, 40 plots for bartenders uh, with my best friend. We grow ingredients to make cocktails. All right. And we noticed that all the purveyors were going through the back door, talking to the chef, and we're in the front like, what about us? So we have our own land here where we grow everything that we want to drink. And we have plenty of space to lay out a table All right. and have some dinner. So right. let me give you some Southern hospitality. Yeah, okay. here and cook. Yeah, yes, we got to yeah. definitely stay in touch. If there's some questions in the chat, we're like way across our counter from the computer. Gabby, let us know. Let us know. <laughs> so, y'all yeah, are <laughs> Yeah, I, I think you you're all you're all caught up for now. There were some questions, but everyone kind of jumped in together and, <laughs> and answered them during. Um, awesome. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for sharing that amazing recipe. I am so excited. It's amazing. Every time it I really is. And it make it catches us off guard how amazing it is. I'm like, damn. So please and please come to New York and visit us at MoFad. We'll be oh, in New York well, in a couple days. Probably about we'll do, weeks. We'll be there. Great. We'll do like an in-person 
program and we'll, you know, we won't have to like lick the screen because we're so hungry. That's how we felt um, the whole way through. I know. Yes. I, had to, I had to whip something together. Like. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I might, I might need you to make that again. So uh -huh. Yeah. Um, but thank you, thank you, Preeti. Thank you, love you. That was amazing. And I, I think we're ready to to pass it over to yes. Tint for our little like performance yes. closing out the evening. Junior, you ready? You ready for us? Okay. Yes. Hello. Hello, everybody. How is everybody feeling? Wonderful. Okay, okay work. Stunt. Okay. Because, okay, so hello, I'm Junior Mint. I am so excited to be with you all tonight. I'm honestly, I'm in awe of every single artist who went before me because what you all do with drinks and food is the definition of what I wanna embody with you all because what you all gave us was not just food and drink, you gave us love, you gave us history, you gave us culture, you gave us support, you gave us so much more than just nourishment for our body. You gave us nourishment for our soul. And when I was thinking about what I was going to do for this, I thought about, you know, drag number. I thought about a mix I could do. I thought about a lot of things. And then it clicked to me that my connection to food is something that is so deeply rooted to who I am. So for example, the only spaces where my mom really had some deep, deep conversations with me about who I was as a person was while we were kneading the dough for the crust of the pie that we were gonna make for Thanksgiving. And so what I wanted to do was, I wanted to take you on a journey down memory lane with me through my life. And as well on top of it, take you through your own and help you appreciate the food that you've experienced in your own life. Because, so right now, just take a moment and think about the first time you ate a plate of food or drank from a beverage and felt love, felt, the person who crafted that for you, who felt like someone put intention into what they just gave you, that you were going to nourish your body with something that they put love into. And I say that specifically because for me, that was every single meal that I ate from my mother. That was every single, every single moment of preparation. And down to even the thought about what side I'm gonna put the napkin on and what side I'm gonna put the beverage on, thinking about your, your comfort the entire way. And I say this because as a black trans woman, I discovered my connection to food later on in life that I didn't know I had younger on. So I was the little kid who was so self-conscious, so in my own head about who I was as a person that I couldn't really think or anything. I couldn't really even think about who I was. But then when I would get into the kitchen, I grew up in a house full of like black women. It was basically just black women. And so the kitchen was always the center of the household. And that's where it immediately when you walked in, you felt love, you felt, you felt like things were in order. You felt like everyone knew exactly where their station was in the kitchen. And it was a place where I knew immediately that I had a space to shine. And I remember my mom, even as a little kid, she would start me off just with the green beans and taking the ends off. And then it would slowly progress to teach me how to make baked macaroni and cheese, to sweet potato pie, to all of these different creations that I specifically remember the first time that we ever made sweet potato pie together. And I get emotional about it because I remember I remember in that whole moment thinking how much attention my mom was giving just to me just for me to, to teach me this one thing that I would get to serve my family. And while we were doing it, she taught me what the importance of all of the meals she created for our family was. She told me about when she was a little girl, my family is from um, South Carolina, my mom's side of the family. And she told me about um, her kneading the dough out and my grandmother telling her about growing up in South Carolina and fighting the KKK off of their farm. That's what her memories were of learning how to make a sweet potato pie. And how, when she was kneading out the dough with her grandmother, she told her how she did that same exact thing with her, with her great grandmother. And that legacy and that lineage of love and consideration that goes into the food that's going to nourish your people. And my mom also taught me the history of our family and of our legacy and the legacy of black people in this country. And the fact that the reason I know how to cook chitlins is because our slave owner gave us the scraps off of the pig, gave us the scraps. And still my people 
my family, my ancestors found a way to turn the scraps, the things that they would throw away into nourishment, into more than just nourishment, into love, into something that is a legacy I still know how to create today. I know, I will, I know I'll be feeding my children and teaching my children the exact same legacy of pride, love, and endurance that they had. And I'll never forget when the first time she taught me how to make collard greens, I have a feeling that she was starting to realize that I was queer. Because as we were starting to, you know, you got to let them sit before basically the whole goddamn day. You're basically just letting them sit before the, for however long. And I remember as we were just like preparing seasonings, thinking about what, what the next steps were, she started to talk to me about one of um, her best friends when I was growing up that like, when we moved away, we didn't have much contact with just because of the distance. And as we're making these collard greens and as we're preparing this meal, she's telling me about how I never knew it, but that best friend was a trans woman and how that trans woman said that I was such a precious person to her and how basically that woman saw a bit of herself in me and saw the transness in me as a kid. And my mom felt comfortable enough while we were preparing this meal to tell me that, a moment that I know we probably wouldn't have shared if we had left the kitchen. And I say this all because think about how many times somebody has sat down and shared a piece of themselves with you on a plate or in a cup. I think about how many times somebody has shown some vulnerability to you in a way that you just didn't necessarily know how to comprehend until later on. And I say that because I realized how many deep conversations me and my mother had in that kitchen that I didn't know we were having, that we were having while we were pinching out seasonings when she was teaching me how to make pancakes. And now, one of the most beautiful experiences in my life is getting to go home whenever I go home now. To also, mind you, go home to DC and uh, literally, and I go down and I go down to my mom in DC. And it's so amazing now because she has taught me that as we are making these meals, we are also creating a whole legacy of our own. So now we go out and now she's looking at me and she's saying, well, what do you wanna to make tonight? And we'll add a spin to it. Okay, so like, what are you feeling? And like, we can come up with a whole new recipe for your family. And so the thing that I've realized through food is that not only does it grow with you in terms of teaching you the traditions beforehand, it teaches you that you have a hand in the traditions. You have a hand in not only understanding your legacy, but you have a hand in creating a whole new legacy for the next generation that's coming right below you. And that's so important when it comes to thinking about pride as well, because Food is something that has been so policed with not only black communities, but as well queer communities. I grew up in Camden, New Jersey, if you don't know. It had the highest murder rate per capita when I grew up there. It was a food desert. And on top of it, it was a place where we had to drive over an hour and a half just to get to a place that had fresh vegetables. And my mother taught me resilience when I look back at that. My mother drove an hour and a half out of her way and back to make sure that the nutrient that was going into my body and going into my brother's bodies was something that was of quality and of love. And on top of it, something that she would wanna serve herself because one of the most beautiful things about food in general is the fact that so many of the same ingredients exist so many places. And so for me, having lived up and down the East Coast, I've seen the ways in which, um, the, oh, the ways in which okra can be cooked in New Orleans as opposed to South Carolina as opposed to Maryland. And it's all a part of this beautiful legacy and history that's completely tied through cuisine. And for example, getting to watch all of you make all of these amazing creations, I'm sitting in here and listening to you all connecting to these ingredients in your own ways. And I'm sitting here being like, at my 10th birthday, my mom, she sat me down, she threw a birthday party for me and all of my like family and everything. And she made me a margarita with a shot of tequila on the side because that's how she took it. This is my 10th birthday. And she said to me, I want you to understand one, that in moments of celebration, it's okay to take part in, these, in alcohol and in these different things. But I want you to also understand that there's a responsibility to it and there's an art to it. And this is what she said to 10 year old me. She literally is telling me that there's an art for it because she said, there's a reason why this is what I'm drinking. This is a reason why this is the time I'm drinking it. And she taught me to put so much mindfulness into what is going into my body and why it's going into my body. And that type of love and consideration is what I think about when I think about everything that you all did, because you all 
just truly took me back to my childhood with every single thing that you all created, with you all telling your connection to, to literally every single thing that you all said, I was like, this is, this is all I ever want to be done with any form of cuisine. I just want it to be consistent about an expression of the person who's creating it. And do you know that with what you all just did, you all just fully created a whole new memory that these people can create for their own families and for their own lives? Like a piece of you is forever gonna be with them. And that's the beauty of food. And when I look back and I think about all of the different meals I've had over my life, even the ones where I had no idea of how much love was going into it. There was a woman standing in the kitchen, taking off the, the rotted bits of the lettuce and the cabbage, who was thinking about the cleanliness of, the, of, the, of everything that was going into my body. And I just keep repeating it mainly because we don't think about it enough, how much consideration and love goes into so many of the small things in life. How many times do you get a, I'm just checking on you text message or all of the different things that are just small little nuanced things. And so I say it because culinary arts is an art for a reason. And on top of it, as an art form, it carries a legacy and a strength and a power. And I say that because even, even when I think about the fact that when I stand in the kitchen and I stand over a pot, there's so much history of my mom as a person who used to clean people's homes and as well cater meals for people. There's a whole legacy of her finding a way to not only feed herself, but also feed a community. To find a way to not only keep that beautiful joy within her family, but also make sure it's shared amongst others. And so, yeah, so that is the end of one story and one beautiful, beautiful tangent and tidbit about my mom and the love that she shared. But I also wanna share a story of the first time that my mom <laughs> basically told me about other queer people in my family. And of course it was over a meal. And I had just come out to my mom when I was like 18, I was in college and I was like, okay, I can be queer as I wanna be. I'm out of the roof, you know, be myself, having a good time. And so I go back home for Thanksgiving and we are preparing this meal for me and my brothers, right? And we're going through everything. And steadily she's talking about everything in the most metaphorical sense. So she's, it feels like she's kind of giving the like birds and bees talk, but like very much about sexuality. So she's like, yeah, you know, eggs come in a lot of varieties and you never know when you're gonna find a brown egg with your white eggs, you know what I mean? And so she's saying all of these things while we're preparing this meal. And I was like, I don't know what she's really getting at, but like, I was like, okay, I guess I'll take it. She's trying to be funny or something. And then she just looks over at me, mind you halfway through me mixing up the mac and cheese and everything. So I got it in the metal pan and everything and my hands are in it and I'm mixing it up. And she just looks over at me and she just goes, Junior, I just want you to know that you're not the only queer person in this family. And tell me the most awkward moment of being your hands in this squishy kind of cheesy substance. And you're just like, what made you think of this right now? And then I was like, um, okay, what do you mean? And all, my brothers are upstairs. So she's talking kind of in a low voice, but at the same time, very much just like, you need to know this. And so I keep mixing it up and I'm adding more seasoning or whatever. And she just goes, well, I never thought I would tell you this, but your dad is bisexual. And I was like, yeah, everybody's face, everybody's face, the face crack. I was like, you know how helpful this would have been to know? You know how helpful it would have been? And, um, and literally, she then goes into telling me about like her own sexual experiences with women. And I was like, do you know how helpful this would have been to know? And so we're doing all of this stuff and we're, then we're going into like, we're getting into this comfortable territory of really being able to share each other with one another. And we're talking about these experiences. And I begin to actually find like in the, in the method in the methodology, in the methodology of like just moving things and doing things, you can kind of open up a piece of yourself that you didn't really plan on opening up. So you're like, oh yeah, I know I need to do this, mix this thing up. And I just started talking and I didn't realize how open the cooking process was making me. And I was telling her about how growing up, how so deeply I 
didn't like my body. And now for the first time, understanding myself as a woman, I started to fall in love with myself and realize that my body was actually something I could own and love. And all of these different pieces of myself. And then she just looks over at me and goes, I hope that you know that from the moment you came out of my womb, I knew that you were a woman because you already had a sense of understanding that like basically, long story short, she said she knew I was not somebody to fuck with and not to, basically I didn't take bullshit straight out the gate so she knew I was a woman. She was like, yeah, you immediately did not put up with anybody bullying anybody. You didn't put up with anybody doing anything. And I immediately was like, that's a mother, that's a mother. And through this whole cooking process, I realized that it's a love language. It is truly and deeply a love language. And while I was making all of this food, at the end of the whole process, the mac and cheese comes out the oven. We're ready, we're about to call my brothers down for like dinner on Thanksgiving and everything. And she just looks at me and she just goes, I never thought in a million years, because as well, she never thought that she would have a girl period because of my two brothers. So like, and I was a surprise baby. So she was like, I never in a million years thought that I would actually get to have a daughter that I would get to pass these recipes down with. Because when I was doing all of this with my own mother, I never in a million years thought that I would have my own family, have my own children. And I know that once you pass these down to your children, a piece of me will always be with them. And that was the moment where I realized the, the legacy, the love, the tradition, and the fact that it's, it's about knowing that the same way my hands were in that mac and cheese, it's the same way my grandmother, my great-grandmother, my great-great-grandmother did it, had conversation, got to know their children, got to know their loved ones. And yeah, and I say it all because food is just magical. Food is beautiful and food is something that everyone deserves to have access to. And it makes me so, so emotional when I think of the fact that like, I got to watch all of these amazing queer people and especially queer brown women get to like, share a piece of themselves in the art that they're creating and as well get to not only share a piece of yourself but also just be yourselves because I felt the kindness the joy the love through the screen and I felt it in everything you created so thank you thank you and that's why when I thought about things I was going to do I'm happy I did this because I realized that the greatest thing I could do during this experience especially during pride is get to share the legacy of food and love that I experienced which is all through my mother it's just all through it. So I'm truly like, trust me, I'm going to send y'all videos of like me recreating the things y'all made because y'all truly, it, you taught me, you just reminded me of the love, the love that I have in the kitchen. So thank you. Thank you. And yes, I, I'm obsessed and I love you all so much. And I went, I went faster than I thought I would at this because yeah, I guess you all got me in the zone, but I, yeah, I wanted to share those two things with you. And again, I just, yeah, thank you. Thank you for as well connecting pride with food because it's something that like a lot of people would not connect, but food scarcity and food deserts are things that are so prevalent in queer communities and black communities and all brown communities. So thank you. And yeah, just remember that every single piece of the food and drink that you put into your body, there's been a lot of thought and consideration put into it. Make sure it's a thought and consideration you want put into it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's all I have to say, and thank you. Oh, that's yeah. amazing! That's so good. <laughs> here. Thank you so much. I just love everything you said, and I'm so grateful to you and everyone who spoke tonight and shared. And um, Gabrielle, thank you for bringing us all together. I'm I'm so honored that Queer Food Foundation um, was willing to partner with MoFad this month, and wow, I've, I have I now know all of you and I've learned so much this evening and I really love everything you said, Junior, just about, um, you know, I think there's a lot of cliches around food is like, oh, food solves everything. We can all sit at the table and find world peace. And like, obviously that's not true, but mm -hmm. just the, um, the routine and the ritual that you spoke about created like a space where your mother was comfortable and just just having this conversation with you. And I think just having that distraction and having that, um, you know, just that rote thing where we're doing this thing that feels so normal and comfortable and we're nourishing ourselves, you know, while we're having these really big, huge moments together is, is so beautiful. And like you said, you've now created memories. You've shared your memories and created new memories for all of us. So thank you so much for that. Um, Preeti, lovey, thank you. Delicious, Tiffany. 
you're the best. You're just, a, you're just such a, a ray of light. Um, AJ had to go back to work, but obviously we love her. That was incredible. Yeah. So thank you all so much. We have one more program with Queer Food Foundation uh, next week on Wednesday, again, the same time at seven o'clock Eastern. It's going to be a food writing workshop all about um, learning about how to be queer and be a writer and how those things intersect and hear the experience of different queer food writers. Um, so I hope you'll come back for that. And Gabrielle, anything you want to you wanna say before we head out tonight? Yeah, I just want to thank everybody again so much for being willing to, I guess, collab on an event like this. I know it sounds like so out there when I reach out to people and ask them to participate in these types of things, but I feel so honored and lucky to be in community which, with such um, artistic, creative, intellectual individuals. And I really hope that we can partner again on an event. So thank you everybody so much. Thanks everyone. Thank Take you. care. Good night. It was beautiful thank to meet you, you all. Thank you, you so much. Let's Can't wait this. for the future. See you soon, Tiffany. Yeah. I love y'all. Y'all are all awesome. I love y'all. Yes. Yeah. 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 Cheers to your mom, you. Junior. Wow. I Come on, okay. Delma. Okay, Mama. Okay, Mama. Yes. Here's to your mom. Mm. Yes. Uh, yes. Mm.